Welcome to Grow My Business or Sell It, the podcast that helps entrepreneurs in three ways. How to grow your business in the most cost-effective way, how to sell it for as much money as possible, and how to invest the proceeds of all that hard work. Whichever stage you're at, Listen up, because I guarantee you'll take something valuable from every episode. Welcome back. My guest today has made a career out of acquiring two kinds of assets, companies and property. One of his companies has handled over a billion pounds worth of transactions, while the other is focused on decarbonization and is positioning itself to win some major government contracts as we move towards a net zero future. He also happens to be Scotland's biggest private landlord with hundreds of properties in his portfolio. His name is Graham Carling. Graham, welcome to the show. Hi, Graham. Nice to see you. And you too. And of course, I think you're, you're coming to us today from Spain, but these days you're, you're more based in, in Dubai, in the UAE. Yes. Um, yeah, we've been there uh, just over a year now. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good you know, international hub. It's a good, a good location uh, for us as we're, we're expanding our business interests and real estate uh, interests. Uh, uh, across the across the globe now, really, and um, so Dubai just fits uh, it fits geographically. It's a great it's a great city, and we work with uh, partners and um, are looking to expand our business in the GCC region also. So it's yeah, it's a, it's a good spot. Okay, well, I, I certainly want to come back and talk to you a bit about property later on in in, in our little chat, but I really want to start you know talking about uh, business because we're all about helping entrepreneurs to to grow their business and eventually to to sell it for the the best possible price. Um, and you, you seem to have done a combination of some businesses that you grow organically and others that you go out and acquire. I just wonder what, what's your experience been as to the most effective way of growing a business? Is it kind of the the organic, you know, method, one customer at a time over a period, or is it the you know going out and buying up your competitors as as fast as you can? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, this is really easy for me. Um, this one, it's uh, uh, you know, our view on it is 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 acquisitions, growth through acquisitions. Where there'll be an always be an element of organic growth, but it's far easier to acquire revenue than, than to go and grow it and try and obtain it organically. So we have a very clear path to um, to, to where we want to go, and I would say probably ninety ninety five percent of that will be uh, is purely based on acquisitions. Uh, United Capital, for example, we you know we are very clear we're an acquisitions business, and. Um, that's what you know. That's why we've seen such good growth uh, over the last few years, despite the COVID slowdown. So, so how do you identify a company that you think is is a great target for for you to acquire? Well, we're 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 clear in terms of the you know we're in the building services sector. Um, the plan for us is to grow, uh, is, is is to acquire, and. Um, you know, good regional operators that are within the fields, particular sectors and services, and with a customer base that we we look for. So what we do is we we haven't done any deals through agents or brokers or anything. We we go and target a company that we quite like, and we go and if you like, knock on the door. We make contact with the principal or the owner or the 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 board of directors and we we start discussions with them so we they're very we have a targeted approach but of course you know we have a profile now of of doing deals and uh, a good team so that attracts uh, you know uh, sellers that may or may not be on well more often than not are not on the open market that will contact us privately and um, ask if we would be interested in them and there's a lot of interest uh, from their point of view um you know, being part of a bigger group and part of a bigger project. And uh, uh, generally, are you acquiring companies where the owner operator is looking to kind of step back and retire? Or is it more a case of you're a path to growth for them because of all the support services you can provide? Yeah, that's a, it's a mixture, really. Um, there, there has been a mixture in terms of the acquisitions. Um actually, if someone's uh, looking to retire, it's generally an easier deal. Uh, because they have an impending event, they're looking, you know, the clock's ticking, if you like. 
um, that, that's not it normally uh, it makes makes the transaction uh, easier, if you like, uh, be, because of that. But really, for us, we're looking for uh, because they're good regional operators and uh, good at what they do. We, we we would like to retain the existing management team, certainly you know tier two level of management team. Um, certainly in the short to medium term, so two, three, five years, you know, we like to see a con- continuity there. But we are attractive now at the scale that we are at uh, for, if, you, if you're a, an independent operator, you know, a good, well-run, well-managed, profitable business, how do you get a seat at the big table on some of the new and exciting projects that are coming out, particularly around the renewables? Um, so joining a group like United Capital um, is, is, is an attractive discussion, uh, certainly for that. And, and how do you kind of structure the transaction? Because obviously in the retirement scenario, I guess they're wanting as much money up front as possible, whereas in the growth scenario, mm-hmm. they probably want a, a, an equity stake in the bigger entity. Yeah. Again, it depends on the deal. It's very much done on a deal-by-deal um, basis. I think... Uh, you, you know, we, we, you know, there's always a, there's, there's an element of an up, you know, an, an on completion consideration, then, then, you know, normally defer consideration of earnouts or, or what have you, because, you know, it's, it's some of the, some of the sellers see the opportunity and see the potential upside of being part of a bigger group, and they, they've maybe plateaued and they can't take it to the next level, so we can assist them. In doing that, but it's very much done on a deal by deal basis. Okay, and can you just talk us through, you know, one example of a kind of end to end acquisition process you've been through, just to help people understand the kind of steps in the process, the time scale, and the kind of perhaps some of the creative thinking that has to go on to get a deal over the line. Well, I mean, we've done deals within one week, and we've been working on other deals for over three years. I mean, and that's the truth. I mean, gen- genuinely. The the and, and and everything else in between, so it really depends. It goes back to the basics, really. I mean, we're always keen to get the deal done through, um, you know, through diligence and get it done uh, and move on to the next deal because we have very ambitious targets, if you like. So we can we don't have time to wait three years. Um, but and when we've done deals within a week, um, you know they're smaller size businesses. But it goes back to you know if you have a motivated, motivated seller, a willing seller, and a willing buyer, you know you can cut through a lot of stuff. You know a lot of um, a lot of the, the you know some of the deals you know that we've done in a week. You know we 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 wouldn't put them through six months of diligence. They just that would kill the deal. It would be, it would cost too much. You just, it wouldn't be worth it. So sometimes you have to take a view at it. So again, a lot of that comes through experience of doing deals, and you 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 know you you get a, a feeling uh, for, for where the business is. But um, if I talk, you know, um, a, a standard transaction, if you like, so you know, not 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 a week, and not three years. You know, it would generally take. You know, discussions would start. You know, you, you you know we would start maybe maybe month two or three, really getting into the the net grit of the commercials in terms of the value and uh, how we would structure the, the payment structure over a period of time. But of course, that could all change during diligence. You know, things come up. You know, um, both sides, um, but uh, whereby you might need to tweak the price and you might need to adjust the terms. But normally, you know, we would be from starting knocking on someone's door on some of the deals. And I'm talking businesses in the turnover range of between 10 and 30 million. Um, so that's the, that's the level that we, we are operating at now. So we would knock on their door, maybe month two or three. We'd agree the commercials. They would possibly get delayed another month or so, even though we've agreed, you know, at heads of terms between the lawyers, then you're possibly another three months to four months after that, based on how uh, up to date the information is from the sellers, that they can get to, to you know to the lawyers into the data room and all that stuff, and we can do a proper diligence check on it. Then you've got the final adjustments uh, near the end. Then you would get it over the line. So it's it's normally, I mean, it should be quicker, but the reality is for the bulk of them at that size. It's around six, seven, eight months, you know, um, really. 
But like I say, you can do them within a week. It, it can be done. But you're also, I mean, you're dealing, I guess, with human emotions and psychology because these are businesses these folks yep. might have put years into building. And it's a bit like giving up your baby, isn't it? You know, it's it's something very personal. And, and I guess, you know, people might have second thoughts when it gets serious and they go, oh, am I really going to do this, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've seen that a lot. You know, the seller's remorse at the at the end, um, it, you know, it comes up. Um, so I think the relationship and the, the, the keeping the dialogue going and the engagement going, uh, at some point, you know, they either need to – um, go for it or or not, and um, we've had we've had it all, you know. We're right at the death. It's just you know a change of heart. You know we, we've seen that, which is frustrating. Yeah. Okay. So so um, obviously you're very much um, in this acquisition mode at the moment. How are you funding these acquisitions? Again, very much done on a deal by deal basis. We work with um, uh, family, private family offices. Uh, we we use some commercial finance. Um, there, there could be a mixture of deferred consideration and earnouts. So it really is a mixed bag, very specific to the deal, uh, to, to the deal and the deal structure that we're looking at. So there's no, uh, we don't have, you know, there's no like some massive, you know, pot of money that we're just going to throw at deals. It's very much looked at and risk assessed uh, on a deal by deal basis, depending on what's happening in the market also very important and, and do you use equity in the in the combined group as part of the kind of currency when you're negotiating these deals or are you giving part of the equity to the acquired company we haven't done that yet we haven't had to do that if you like i'm saying had to um what we have done is we're where we've we've uh we've left equity in the selling entity rather than giving it at the group level We've we've left, so we'll buy. You know, we'll buy seventy percent, and the seller will retain a thirty percent um, uh, of of the of his existing company. Yeah. Okay. So, that, so yeah. So, so we've looked. We, so, the, so if you make the whole pie bigger, they own a piece of that larger pie. Um, yeah. And yeah. of course, it's not just some random uh, uh, process you're going through here. The strategy is to really position yourself for these large government-sponsored decarbonisation projects. Tell me a bit about where that strategy has come from and how you're implementing it. Well, I think you I mean it's it's clear. You know, green is the new is the new digital, if you like. You know, uh, the whole renewables and green energy, and and no one's mastered that puzzle yet. So if you if you look at where the where the investment and the money and and uh, the focus is going to be over the coming decade, I mean the amount of money flowing into that that sector is incredible. So for us, you know, what we're looking to do is to create a you know you have a number of smaller individual good 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 well run well managed businesses, but combined, you know, the sum is greater than individual parts. So we want to be a, a credible force going forward, whereby we can actually tender for some of these really, really large contracts that individually those entities wouldn't have a chance at. But as a combined group with a combined balance sheet, with a, a geographic uh, coverage and the full range of services, absolutely, I think, you know, for me, it's uh, that, that's where we want to be moving forward. And for, uh, for, for anyone joining the group, they get to share in that, you know. Okay, and and how? I mean, you know, what we hear about the most, uh, uh, you know, complex and bureaucratic government procurement processes. How how do you go about getting started to, in, you know, so that you even know that these projects are coming along? Well, a number of the businesses that we buy already do th this on a smaller scale. So all of this information is public information. You know, it's all there. It's in it's under you know in procurement. You can go online now and and see that these contracts are all being attended for. Now, what happens is on some of the larger contracts, it's only the largest companies that can get them. So um, they're all there, um, and most of these companies are, are already going, are delivering uh, their services uh, and their ge geography already. So this information is, all, is already out there. We just want to, be, we've got to build a business large enough that can actually... Uh, be a serious player in terms of any tenders uh, that, that come out and, and we are we have a scale in terms of our balance sheet which is important because that precludes uh, most companies from getting get you know getting in there 
is they just don't have a big enough balance sheet. But combined, we combine balance sheet of the group, that will allow us to, to go for some of these bigger tenders. And, and what do you see as the kind of target size of the company that you need to get to to be attractive in those tenders? Well, I, I mean, we've said openly we would like to get to a 500 million turnover of business uh, within the next three years. Um, and I, I think that's about the right scale. I think the combined balance sheet of that and the, ge- the geography that will give us, um, we'd certainly be in with uh, uh, with a good chance of picking up you know some of the, some some of these contracts that come out. Okay, and and what are some of the lessons you've learned from acquiring these companies as you've tried to integrate them into the group? What what sort of things have gone well? What sort of things have given you the most headaches? Well, the. I suppose if, if we look back at over our time, um, buying distressed businesses has gave us the biggest headache because it slows you down. Uh, you might get a deal, you know, it might be a good deal. You can pick it up on the cheap, um, or you know, or you think. But in actual fact, for us, it really it slows you down. So when we're on a, 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 a very rapid growth. And rapid acquisitions, they 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 getting distracted into the management of these these businesses that you've acquired is the challenge. You know, trying not to get and keep the focus on the acquisitions. So we don't look at distressed businesses. Um, people do. People make a lot of money at it, and they can turn them around and and all of that stuff. That's just not what we do, and that's probably. Um, for us has been the big, biggest headache, if you like, that, we, that we've gone through. Some of the other ones, uh, you know, when we bought, uh, again, good managed, well-run businesses, um, we're, we're a good management team, they still need direction and focus and they need, to be, they need to then feel part of the group. So that's something that we've worked a lot on uh, over the last sort of 18 months, so even through COVID, where the new acquisitions, because they're still trying to find them feet and operate individually, because that's what they've always done. So um, in my view, the sooner you can get them integrated, the better, even though it's, it, you know, it's probably, you, you know, they're, they're going well, it isn't broken, so what do you, why do you need to fix it? But in actual fact, to leave them out there um, over time, they, they, you know, to become a bit disengaged. So you, you know, my what we do is we look at integrating them quickly now. So we have a, a post acquisition process uh, on any any of the acquisitions coming into the group, whereby we really make them feel part of the family, if you like, um, from day one. Where we maybe didn't do that at the start. Okay, and what what sort of things does that process involve? How do you make them feel part of the family? Well, yeah, well, we have a marketing team. You know, we get them involved in it. We have we make sure that we're having. Uh, monthly meetings, physical, um, we're having them, you know, we just we just came back. For example, we had uh, all the senior managers and some of the, you know, we're an employee of the year program. Uh, we had three apprentices, um, rising stars that we took across to Dubai and had a big company conference. So all the company leaders, the, the senior managers and the ones, uh, so we, we've got them all under the one roof. And that's something that we do every year now. So the next one's in Spain. <laughs> so, th- you know, things like that to really get them started because that's not something that they'd ever been used to before as a small independent business. Okay. And do you have some kind of group-wide operating board that they sit on so they actually get to meet the, the opposite numbers in the other companies you've acquired? We do. So United Capital, we don't run the company. So we are the holding company and we're very focused on acquisitions. Underneath us, we have the United Capital Operating Group which is made up of the normally the managing director and finance director or commercial director of each of the entities. And they run the operational side of it to pull the, the operations uh, together. So they're very much independent. We have a nominated non-exec on the board, but that is, they, they're very much to pull the whole operational side. Um, and talk to each other. Okay, great. So um, what do you see as the the sort of end game for United Capital and what would be your your kind of exit strategy? Well, I think, I mean, the end game is, is, like I say, 500 million (coughs) uh, national coverage. Um, And we'll see what the market market dictates in terms of, you know, uh, any exit or, or, or anything at that time. But, for us, 
We're so focused now on the acquisitions um, and getting, because we really see huge opportunity in that. And we believe we're in the right space, you know, so um, we're not thinking too far ahead. But clearly, if we're in the right space and we're doing the right things, you know, the market will look after that. You know, the market, we, we so um, for me, in terms of any exit, it, it's not something that we've got set in stone. The rather on a particular date or time, the market will dictate, you know, uh, where we are. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, this is what we do. This is, you know, we, we buy businesses, you know, we sell, we'll sell some businesses if it's right for the, for us. So, um, but that will be dependent on the market, really. And I guess to me, one of the most important things uh, that really comes out of your whole story here is, is thinking big and, and looking at the mega trends that are going on and then working out how you can participate in them at, at, at that kind of bigger level. So um, I know you, 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 you're you great mates with uh, Robert Kiyosaki. I just wonder if you've had this kind of discussion and, and his input has helped to bring your own thinking up to this kind of level. Hmm. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, we spoke about this when we were over, over there a couple of years ago, um, just, just before COVID. Um yeah, look, you know, we, but but I can take I can take this right back to two thousand and two when I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. It's the it's the same uh, thinking, you know. We we uh, we've always looked at it on a macro level, you know. Then how do we bring that down? Um, but it doesn't have to be that big. But for for me and us and our team, it is. You know, this is a team game. Um, we have a good, uh, you know, we have a board of directors. If you want to scale up and be you know, do big deals. It, it's not I, it's we. You know, you have to have a good team, a credible team uh, behind you that are sharing your vision, that understand it and are clear on the vision. And, um, uh, and that, you know, that certainly helped, helped me, it's helped us uh, achieve what we've done so far. And, um, you know, don't get me wrong, you know, we wish we'd have done more. Um you know, that's part and parcel of it. Yeah, but of course, one of the uh, you know challenges that we entrepreneurs face sometimes can be we're so focused on the business it can threaten kind of personal and family relationships. But in your case, I know your, your wife Leanne is heavily involved in the business, so I guess you've you've yes. made that work between the two of you. We have, and we've all you know we were in, but we we met working with each other, and it's funny because we do get asked this question a lot. We don't know it any other way. You know, I, we just, that's always what we, it's not something unusual or um, <laughs> we just genuinely don't know it any other way. And, and all we do is, you know, we love what we do. We love talking about it when we're out for a meal or, uh, you know, any, we, but it's just what we do. So um, for us, it, um, it just works. But I guess also you just have a clear division of, of labour, so you know who's doing what, and you're not treading on each other's toes the whole time. Absolutely, yeah. We stay in our lane, you know, and um, uh, we uh, and when we, we we do cross over, it's a, there's a crash, you know, there's a, a crash or a class. So we th- we tend to stay in our own lane that way, and you know, we, we do have different skill sets, we have different temperaments, we would, di- and so it's using the right clubs for the right shots, and uh, we're, we're pretty good at that, you know. Okay, now let, let, let's just wind the clock back a bit, because you, you mentioned Rich Dad, Poor Dad there, and for you, really, it, it all started with property, didn't it? Did you, just tell us a little bit about your, your, your property investment journey and how you actually grew to be Scotland's largest private landlord. Well, we started uh, just in the, the property crash in 2000. Uh, seven eight, you know that's when we got in. But prior to that, asset prices were high. The numbers didn't make any sense, um, and um, so we were waiting. You know, we're again looking at the big picture, and um, we've seen it. So when the property prices started to crash, there was value in the market, so it was a good time to get in. Now we to, to get us started, we um, you know we didn't have uh, we didn't have a lot of capital. You know we didn't have um, we needed to recycle and refinance and get it done. And, of course, the markets were tightening in terms of the funding. But we were able to get going just before it got really, really uh, tight in terms of the property and the financing of it. 
And we just kept going. We just kept going, kept going. And as, so as people were getting out, we were getting in and just kept growing it. Then we had to change strategy as, to, as finances tightened. We teamed up with other people's private individuals, um, private offices. So whilst everybody was sitting moaning um, about, oh, we can't get the funding, we can't get the money, and I'm out now for a few years. We just had, had to work it out how we're going to get the funding because there's so much value and uh, opportunity there in the market. So we did. So we just went. We just went and uh, raised money where we could in order to. You you were always able to get mortgages. They were just a bit more expensive, lesser loan to value, uh, a bit tougher. You know, you couldn't flip properties so quickly and, and all that stuff. Or if you were buying for a refurb, you know, they changed the rules where you had to wait. You know, six months, twelve months. So we just had to adjust to it, um, but the opportunity was there. And kind of that's what, so, so we just kept going where everybody was getting out. And kind of that's where we are with the building services. That's why it was a, it was clearly the other side of the coin. You know, you'll know yourself getting with the property, uh, the properties in terms of yields and stuff. Now, you know, we're, 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 you know, we're probably 50% down on where we were in terms of the yield on, on where we were in 2008-9. You know, I uh, say so you need double the amount of properties to, to earn the same amount of money because of regulation, uh, you know, taxation, all that stuff. So what we had to do, but so what we said was uh, it would be good to have a piece of the other side of the part, the other side of this coin here. So ultimately, and we knew, you know, we, we'd done so many property renovations and developments and, and, and so on that um, it was just a natural, sensible thing. But most importantly, you know, knowing um, the existing built environment. So we don't really build new builds. We don't touch that. That's a you know the, the guys are great at that. That's not our market. But to if you like uh, retrofit and repurpose and decarbonize existing buildings, that uh, and we see you know how much it costs to do that. And our businesses are if you like specialists in, in doing that type of activity. So that's why you know we see huge opportunity in that uh, space. So are, are you still buying properties yourself or are you just kind of resting on the portfolio that you've built over the years? Yeah, we, we haven't bought now for a couple of years. We're actually selling some of our pro- properties. It goes back to, you know, asset prices and uh, and all that stuff. It's a good time to be uh, selling. We, we haven't done much, but we're watching closely and sitting waiting and we'll see what happens in the, over the coming over the coming, you know, uh, months and years, if you like. Yeah, and and has has most of the portfolio been residential, or have you gone into commercial property at all? M- most residential. I mean, we've done we've done a few uh, commercial to resi conversions. We have some office buildings uh, that we lease out. that's done well for us, um, but in the main, it's been it's been residential. Which, by the way, I know, I still I still love that. You know, I still you know uh, uh, that's 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 where we started, if you like, and. Um, but the numbers need to make sense for us. Indeed, yes. And, uh, you know, there, there was a time there with George Osborne and co where it looked like, you know, you, you, private landlords were like public enemy number one, you know, and there's just every year there's some, some new twist to the knife, wasn't there? Yeah. I still think that's the case, by the way. I don't think that's gone away. You know, it's... Uh... <laughs> yeah, and yet suddenly, you know, there's still a housing shortage. It's a bit bizarre, isn't it? But yeah. what about, you know, because we're seeing big financial institutions coming into this now, aren't we? You know, banks talking about owning 10,000 properties and things. I mean, h- how do you think that's all going to work out? Well, look, I mean, I think, I mean, clearly that's what the government wants, and that makes sense. You know, they they don't want the small, you know, accidental landlord, you know, what was it, five, you know, five million properties and three million landlords or something a few years ago in the UK. I mean, how do you manage that and control that? So difficult. Big money going into it, I think it's sensible. Um, I think uh, uh, for me, it brings stability for tenants, uh, you know, and and they can uh, cope with, um, you know, the, the big the, the big the big companies or the big funds can cope with changes and. You know, legislation where some landlords. I mean, when we were when we had a property management business, I mean, some landlords were so skint. You know, they, they couldn't even replace a, a broken toilet and things. I mean, it was it was pretty grim. So, you know, the whole sector and industry did did need professionalised. Does need professionalised. I've seen uh, today that you know Church of England. Now, you know, they're looking at you know building thirty thousand affordable homes on their land. 
And again, that's big, you know, that's big work and that's good, you know, big and, and the PRS uh, sector as well. But I don't think it's gone uh, as quick as it should have gone. But of course, um, you know, we've had COVID and all that. But I think it's the right thing to do. Um, and the government, in terms of how they, you know, the taxation and all that, have made it clear. You know, they don't favour the small guy now, unfortunately. No, OK. Um, and obviously, you know, it's very, I think, uh, telling and very educational for people listening to us how you've you started in property, you've built your portfolio, you've then seen the opportunities on the other side of the fence in property services. You've then started thinking bigger about moving into this whole green area of decarbonisation, and then you've started acquiring and assembling this group to get to the scale to do that. Um, so, w- what do you think? And obviously, now we've had you know, events in in Eastern Europe and so on, and all kinds of issues with inflation, supply chains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. Feels to me like that there's almost kind of a bit of a a bump in the road as we head towards the green agenda, and that there's got to be some recognition that we're actually going to be relying on fossil fuels a bit longer than pol- politicians might like. Um, do, do you see yeah. this having any kind of delay or impact on the the kind of plans that you're hoping to take part in? I don't know. I think um, you're. Uh, I would. I would agree with you. Um, it's not going to be as easy a transition as people uh, think it will be, or or would like it to be. But nevertheless, there will be a transition, and it's not there yet. And for for us, we just want to make sure that whenever that is, we've got good existing businesses that position that that are well positioned to be a player and a force. Mm-hmm. In, in uh, you know, I'm not saying disrupting because we're not disrupting, but being there for when this transition comes through. We want to be at the forefront uh, of it. So I, I don't see it having any effect on us because, first of all, it hasn't happened yet. So we're, we're just waiting on it to happen and hopefully it'll gather some momentum over the coming coming years. So so what would you see as the things that are going to drive the first kind of wave of decarbonisation? Would it, would it be things like moving to, to uh, heat pumps instead of bo- gas boilers and things? What, what would be the actual specifics that a typical house would see in terms of decarbonisation? Well, that's exactly it. I mean, that's already happening. You know, a number of councils and local authorities, you know, they're going solar, PV, battery storage, uh, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, you know, all of these things, you know, with, with the, uh, that's already happening now and really beginning to take uh, scale up. So, uh, you know, as, as old boilers get replaced, and, you know, they're, they're, I mean, it's already happening. You have hydrogen uh, boilers, mixed boil, combi uh, boilers. So all of that stuff's there already. I, I think that uh, what we're seeing is that the in terms of procurement, they won't be allowed to replace, you know, an old gas boiler with a new gas boiler, if you like. You know, they, they're going to have to uh, make those changes. So as, as it, uh, you know, these things come to the natural end of their life cycle, then, of course, you've got, uh, you know, just the cost of energy um, and stuff as well. I mean, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, you know, if they're looking for electric cars, you know, the grid can't cope. You know, how do you do that? Solar has to be a solution for battery storage and some and, and property. So, you know, it, it's going to come more on a, as, as they come to their end of their natural life cycle, uh, we think. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, it's going to start happening. And, and probably it's easier to build into new developments than to retrofit to old ones, I suspect. Uh, uh, that's going to yeah. be the harder job, isn't it? Um, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're certainly going to have your your work cut out in in the next few years. I think there's plenty to go at. Um, yeah. So just looking back on your on your on your kind of career so far, both as as a as a, an acquirer of businesses and as an investor, um, for anyone that's kind of listening to us at perhaps at an earlier stage in their journey, what are the kind of let's say the three biggest lessons you would pass on to them if they're trying to grow their own business in the way that you've done so successfully? Well, I think, I'll, I think I'll, you know, as I said earlier on, it's easier to buy revenue than create it. It's, it's quicker. And like, you know, we're talking about seller's remorse and they're hiding over their baby. If you think about it, some of the businesses that have been going on, lifetime businesses, what you're acquiring is 40 years of, you know, blood, well, blood, sweat, and years. You know, and that's what you're acquiring when you go through the acquisition. Why would you want to go and spend, 
10, 20, 30 years going through the same pain and the same the same journey when you can acquire a business that has already uh, done that. So for, for us, we're dead. We're really clear on that. And uh, that's what we do. So um, I, I would, uh, if someone, if pe- you know, most people I speak to automatically go into organic growth. You know, we can do it ourselves. Why would you do that? And, you know, we, we're buying businesses. So I digress a bit here. Uh, you know, for for the for the skill set and the staff, you know, we could aqua hire. You know, so we're buying because there's a shortage of labour or skilled tradesmen in certain areas. So it may not be the best company or the best deal, but they have a range of skill set in there that, that we need uh, in order for our businesses. So there's a whole host of reasons why you would buy a business. So certainly, if it if it, if it hasn't been uh, in somebody's mind, to, you know, why you would buy a business as opposed to, um, you know, starting it organically, there's a couple of reasons why. <laughs> there's a couple of reasons right there. Um, the other thing I think, you know, you need to keep your house, you need to have a clear plan. And if you're looking just to create or, or grow a small business or small businesses, okay, that's fine. But if you're looking to really scale it and, um, uh, you know, be you know as big as you can be or as best you can be, you need a team of people. You know, you can't, you really need a good team of people around you. And I would suggest that, you know, when before we bought McGill and had a single customer, and had a single uh, member of staff, we had a board of directors because we knew where we were going with this. We knew we wanted McGill. The McGill business was the platform and profile business, but we it wasn't. That wasn't us stopping there. We were trying to get the five hundred million. So I had identified a board and done a lot of work before we even pressed the button on it. So we had a team of people. So you know you've got to look ahead, or if it's just making you know again a small business, but if you're really looking to scale it. It's a team game. You really need a good team of people um, but beside you. And you need to keep your house in order. You know, it's hard work. Um, particularly if you're looking at exiting, you have to have, you know, your, your information and documents and that. Uh, you know, uh, everything about the business. We can tell quickly how good shape a business is in uh, by the length of time it takes them to give us their, their, uh, their, their information. We can tell really quickly. And, you know, if we don't get it, we'll just, you know, next, we're on to the next one. We just, you just know. So that's important when you're, you know, you actually need to, you know, be thinking about, even though we are not exiting, absolutely we've got a legal and financial officer that is looking after this stuff as we go. We are, if you like, keeping our, uh, uh, our house in order. Uh, as we as we go, so that's an important part. And, and I guess that's um, an important point that that you know, even for somebody who's not necessarily wanting to grow to the scale you have, if they want to position their own business to sell for the highest price, part of all that yes. is having their house in order, having the data room ready, the management team ready yeah. to take over, so that you somebody like yeah. you could come along and say, "Yeah, I can see how we could integrate that into our bigger group." Exactly. See, exactly. And that's really, really important, that, because, I mean, you know, we've kissed a lot of frogs over the years here. We, we really have. And we've wasted a lot of time. And, you know, if it's a choice between, you know, a couple of, you know, two or three businesses that are similar size and similar businesses, we're going to go with the one that has their acting gear, you know, that's going to get us information in a timely manner that, um, you know, answers the phones, is, you know, we're getting responses that are engaged rather than, you know, people scrambling. We've seen it, and but, you know, we've been given the run around. So we've got the scars here. You know, we've been really, we've been really motivated, motivated to do the deal. And we're saying, what's going on? You know, what, what what's going on over there? And uh, I, I finally, you know, we, we've had to pull the plug on, on some of these. And um, yeah, that's because they just didn't have their house in order. Fantastic. Well, you, you, you've certainly given some great uh, value and some great information there today, Graham. If anyone wants to find out a bit more about what you or what United are doing, uh, where, where can they go to find that out? Well, they can go on you know, my LinkedIn page, uh, Graham Carling, um, or um, yeah, united-capital.co.uk to find out more about the, the company there. Okay, brilliant. Well, good luck with your decarbonisation yeah. plans, and thanks very much for joining us today, Graham. Great to see you again, Graham. Thank you. If you'd like to suggest topics for future episodes, appear as a guest on the show, or invite me onto your podcast, you can get me on graham at grahamrowan.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time on Grow My Business or Sell It.